Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Also, welcome to the second episode of Titanic Month here on the channel. Today, we will be discussing the building of RMS Titanic and all of the design choices that made her the beautiful ship she was. Before we dive in, I must inform you. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before I begin that I am not a ship designer, mariner, or expert in the field of maritime history, but I have done my research and will present the information as I understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, I will be including the basics of nautical terminology in the description for anyone who needs it. Today, there will be some terms in the French and German languages in which I am not fluent, but I will do my best to give accurate pronunciations. One more very important note before we begin, all three ships of the Olympic class of the White Star Line are beloved by many, including myself. There is an enormous amount of information on RMS Titanic, some of it conflicting. I will be pulling from many sources and going off of the most common findings among researchers. Please note that as soon as I click post on this video, the information will be outdated. With all of the Olympic class ships, there is new information coming out all the time. There are many details I might leave out for brevity's sake, and no, I don't do that to hide information or confuse. If corrections are to be made in the comments section or additional information added, please feel free to do so respectfully. There's no need to get nasty with one another over 110-year-old vessels that none of us were personally there to witness or record information about. We want to continue to keep the comments section a safe, fun place to talk about our love of ships. We've gotten to the meat and potatoes of this month, the story of RMS Titanic. She is, of course, my favorite vessel to ever float the seas, and I think a lot of us could say that. This episode is for those of you who love design, engineering, and architecture. To start her story, we are going to begin with some background information to set the scene. As for her name, Titanic comes from the Titans of Greek mythology, which makes sense. The Titans were the pre-Olympian gods in Greek mythology, and of course, they were huge and massively impressive. Titanic and her two sisters would be built in Belfast, Ireland by Harland and Wolfe. Titanic was the middle sibling, and for once in the history of middle siblings, she is more well known instead of one of the other two. She was the second of the Olympic class, with the first being the namesake of the class, RMS Olympic, which we covered last Sunday. The last sister, HMHS Britannic, we will cover the final Sunday of this month, as she'd be finished a few years after her two older sisters. This is debated by researchers and is not confirmed, so take it with a grain of salt. But apparently, HMHS Britannic was going to originally be called RMS Gigantic, and she was to be over 1,000 feet long. But again, this can't be verified. We'll get more into that rumor in her episode. As for the White Star Line, they were determined to have the largest, most luxurious ships on the water to compete with not only Cunard Line, but the Holland America Line and Nord Deutscher Lloyd Line as well. Cunard was known for having incredibly fast, efficient ships, and so White Star Line decided they could make the biggest splash in size and luxury, and boy did they. At the time, Olympic and Titanic, and soon to be Britannic, were the largest ships of the White Star Line's fleet of 29 steamships and tender boats. And upon their launching, Olympic and Titanic would each get to be the largest ship in the world. But we all might have asked ourselves once or twice, where did the idea for Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic come from? The idea took root in mid-1907 between the White Star Line's chairman, J. Bruce Ismay, and the American financier, J.P. Morgan. If you were unaware, J.P. Morgan's International Mercantile Marine Company, or IMM for short, was the parent corporation that controlled White Star Line among many other shipping companies, and it damn near monopolized the transatlantic shipping trade for some time until IMM disappeared in 1943 after merging with the United States Line. So, to keep Ismay's goal of being the final say in comfort and luxury, the company set out to upgrade their fleet, primarily in response to the gorgeously fast, quote, Greyhounds of the Sea, RMS Lusitania and RMS Mauritania of the Cunard Line, and to also strengthen their hold on the Southampton to Cherbourg to New York City route that had started in 1907. At the time, four ships were needed to run this route, 
However, it was planned that RMS Olympic, RMS Titanic, and RMS Britannic would be fast enough to run a weekly service to and from without needing a fourth sister, but would still be an enormously bougie experience. So, the ships that the Olympic class would replace would be RMS Majestic and RMS Teutonic of the Teutonic class, as well as RMS Adriatic of the Big Four. RMS Oceanic would remain on the route until Britannic could be completed, since the first two sisters would be completed much sooner and Oceanic was a classy ship in its own right. As we know, Titanic was lost on her maiden voyage, and so RMS Majestic would be put back into place. As for her construction, it would be done with Harlan and Wolf, who'd had contracts with White Star Line as far back as 1867. They were given a lot of leeway in how to design the three sisters, with the company trusting in Harlan and Wolf's expertise. Usually, White Star Line would bring forward an idea to sketch out the general concept of the ship, and Harlan and Wolf would run with this and form the design. White Star Line wasn't concerned with the cost for the three Olympic-class liners, granting Harlan and Wolf permission to spend what they needed to make the three ocean liners perfect, with the addition of a 5% profit margin. For RMS Olympic and RMS Titanic, the two companies agreed to £3 million to build both, plus that 5% fee and, quote, extras to contract. In 2023, it would cost approximately £274,902,667 to build Olympic and Titanic, so it was an enormous investment. And because of this enormous investment and how important it was, Harlan and Wolf assigned their leading designers to the projects. The design was overseen by Lord William James Peary, who was a director for both Harlan and Wolf and the White Star Line. Thomas Andrews, the famous naval architect who went down with Titanic, as well as the managing director of Harlan and Wolf's design department. Andrews' deputy, who was responsible for calculating the ship's design, trim, and stability, Mr. Edward Wilding. And finally, Alexander Carlyle, who was Harlan and Wolf's chief's draftsman and general manager. Carlyle was in charge of equipment, general arrangements, and decorations, and this included the ever-important task of efficient lifeboat davit design. For anyone who doesn't know, we will briefly go over what a davit is and what it is used for. A davit is any of various crane-like devices used on a ship for supporting, lowering, and raising equipment such as boats and anchors. They can be operated by electric winches or manually, and their design has changed tenfold since the days of Titanic. Nowadays, you'll typically see electric winches to lower and raise lifeboats. However, almost all davits are difficult or dangerous to operate when the ship is listing past 10 to 15 degrees, though this isn't always the case. We have seen this in many, many stories, two prime examples being SS Andrea Doria and Costa Concordia, both of which we have covered previously. After about a year's worth of work, the proud designers presented their work to J. Bruce Ismay and other executives of the White Star Line, and Ismay approved of the design. Two days after this, he'd signed three, quote, letters of agreement, essentially contracts, to authorize the construction to begin. At this time, the hull which would become RMS Olympic was simply known as Number 400, since it was Harlan and Wolf's 400th hull they'd laid. Titanic would be based upon a similar but revised design to Olympics, and at this point, she was called number 401. Construction finally began on Titanic on March 31, 1909, with her keel being laid down three months after Olympics. From keel to launch, it would take 26 months total to build Titanic. At the peak of construction, Harland and Wolf had approximately 14,000 men working on Olympic and Titanic, with the ships almost being built in tandem with one another. It took a little over a year to fully frame Titanic, and after the framing was done, large steel plates were riveted into frame. It took more than 3 million rivets to hold the steel into place, each one pounded in by hand. This is something important to keep in mind. At the time of her building, these rivets were made of wrought iron. However, after examinations done by metallurgist Tom Folk, it was found that some of the samples of these rivets contained three times today's allowable amount of slag. Slag is a glassy residue left behind after smelting iron ore, and slag made the rivets less ductile and more brittle than they should have been, and the mushroom-shaped heads of these rivets would have popped off when the iceberg scraped the side of the ship. Keep that in mind for when we go over her sinking next week. Her shell plating would be completed as of October 1910. 
In the hull, Titanic had 24 double-ended and five single-ended boilers containing 159 furnaces. All of these boilers and furnaces powered two massive reciprocating four-cylinder triple expansion steam engines for the wing propellers and a low-pressure Parsons turbine for the center propeller, generating roughly 46,000 horsepower. Each boiler was enormous, standing over two stories tall. Her three propellers were made of bronze, and something important to note is that her propellers are different from Olympic and Britannic. Titanic's propellers were all triple-bladed, whereas Olympic had two triple blades and one quadruple blade in the center. There's a popular picture that claims to show Titanic's propellers with men in front of it, but don't be fooled, those are actually Olympic's propellers. Interestingly enough, many of the pictures of the inside of Titanic that we have are actually of Olympic, and this includes every single photo of the iconic Grand Staircase. Why, you might ask? Because they didn't think Titanic would sink, and so they thought it would be easier and more convenient to only take pictures of the almost identical sister for the time being. As we know from last year's episode on SS Laurentic, the amazing design of the Olympic class's engines were first tested on SS Laurentic and proved to be fantastic. There was a great combination of speed and performance without sacrificing efficiency. Reciprocating steam engines weren't powerful enough to move enormous ocean liners like the Olympic class on their own, but that's where the turbine came in. Turbines alone were powerful but caused uncomfortable vibrations, as seen on RMS Lusitania and RMS Mauritania. By combining the two technologies, you could get an efficient and comfortable ride. Not only this, but fuel usage was reduced and motive power was increased, all while using the same amount of steam. It truly was ingenious. Each of the two reciprocating engines were 63 feet long and weighed around 720 tons, with their bed plates adding another 195 tons onto that. Each of the boilers were 15 feet and 9 inches in diameter and 20 feet long, and they each weighed 91.5 tons, being capable of holding 48.5 tons of water to turn into steam. They were attached to long shafts which drove the propellers. There were three, one for each engine, with the outer propeller's drive shafts being the largest. Each of these drive shafts carried three blades of manganese bronze alloy with a total diameter of 23.5 feet around. The middle propeller, of course, was slightly smaller, and so it was only 17 feet in diameter. Interestingly, it was not capable of being reversed like the other two shafts, and it could only be stopped. Of course, to turn all of that water into steam for the engines, she needed coal. Total in her bunkers, Titanic could carry 6,611 tons of coal, plus an added 1,092 tons and hold three if needed. The furnaces needed over 600 tons of coal a day to power the ship, and this had to be done all by hand. To keep the ship running, a crew of 176 firemen working around the clock would be needed supplying the boilers with the much needed coal. After the coal was burned, ash would be left behind, and so it had to be disposed of. And so, 100 tons of ash would be disposed into the ocean per day. The work wasn't easy, as we learned from studying SS Eastland. It was a long, hard day with back-breaking, dangerous work, and the workers were constantly covered in coal dust and subjected to extreme temperatures. At the very least, the firemen were paid pretty generously, all things considered. However, sadly, the suicide rate among these men was astounding. Not all steam is good steam. Sometimes there's too much, or it's a byproduct of another process on board the ship, and so this exhaust steam needs to be vented somewhere. It was actually used to power the turbine by passing it into a service condenser, and this increased the efficiency of the turbine. It also made it possible to condense the steam back into water and reuse it. All of this steam could power Titanic to a maximum of 23 knots, with an average cruising speed of 21 knots. They called Titanic a floating city at the time, and they really weren't kidding. The electrical plant on board the ocean liner was capable of producing more power than most power stations that serviced cities at the time. Right behind the turbine engine, there were four 400 kilowatt steam-driven electric generators. These were used to provide electricity to the entire ship for all functions, including hotel functions. 
As well as these generators, there were two auxiliary generators for emergency use only that were only 30 kilowatts, and they were located in the stern of the ship in order to, for them to remain operational up until the final moments of the ship's sinking. This sadly would prove useful later on as Titanic sank. RMS Titanic also didn't have a searchlight since she was following the ordinance of the Merchant Navy, which banned the usage of searchlights altogether. For all of the Olympic-class ocean liners, they were divided into 16 primary watertight compartments, separated by 15 bulkheads that extended up to D-deck. There were 11 watertight doors that closed vertically and sealed off compartments in case of flooding or an emergency. The ship's decks were made of a mixture of pine and teak, with the interior ceilings being covered in painted granulated cork to fight condensation and because cork is a very light material. Of the four orange and black painted funnels, only three were functional, with the fourth added purely for aesthetics and kitchen ventilation. There were two masts that were each 155 feet tall, and they were used as supporting derricks for working cargo, with one hoisting the crow's nest. As for steering and maneuverability, Titanic's enormous rudder was 78 feet and 8 inches high, and 15 feet and 3 inches long, weighing well over 100 tons. Due to its enormous size and weight, the rudder actually needed its own steering engines, and so two steam-powered steering engines were added, although only one would be used at a time, with the other kept as a reserve engine. They'd be connected to the short tiller, which is a lever used to steer a vehicle and used primarily in watercraft, through a series of stiff springs. The springs were used to absorb any shock that heavy seas or quick changes in direction could have flicked on the steering engines, kind of like shocks on a car. If things got really bad and the crew were in dire straits, the tiller could be moved by ropes that were connected to two steam capstans. A capstan is a vertical axed rotating machine developed for use on ships to multiply the pulling force of seamen when hauling ropes, hawsers, and cables, and it's pretty similar in principle to a windlass. These capstans were also used for raising and lowering the ship's anchors. There were five anchors total, two kedging anchors, one in the center line, and one on each side, both port and starboard. Now, of course, when you have people aboard your ship, you have to have a way to supply water, heating, and ventilation. RMS Titanic had her own waterworks aboard, and she was capable of pumping and heating water to all parts of the ship through a complex network of valves and pipes. The main water supply was loaded into the ship while she was at port. However, if she happened to run out of fresh water out at sea, she was capable of distilling fresh water from seawater. This process wasn't an easy process, however, since salt deposits could clog up the distillation plant pretty quickly. Insulated ducts throughout the ship moved warm air into each area of the ship using electric fans, and the first-class cabins had their own additional electric heaters. She even had more modern technology that made her state-of-the-art, and that included radio telegraph equipment, one of my favorite things about Titanic. Titanic's Marconi wireless telegraph was incredible. It was far more advanced for her time than most other vessels, if not all, and I've always been fascinated by it. RMS Titanic's wireless telegraphy equipment was leased to the White Star Line by none other than the Marconi International Marine Communication Company. Marconi also supplied two of their employees to work as operators on Titanic, Harold Bride and Jack Phillips. The two maintained a 24-hour schedule, though usually they received and sent out passengers' personal telegrams, but they did also handle navigational messages and messages from other ships, including ice warnings and weather reports. As well as the radio room, there was a soundproofed silent room next to the radio room that housed the transmitter, a motor generator used for producing alternating currents, and other loud equipment. The operator's living quarters was next to the working office as well, making it convenient for them to the radio room. The ship had a, quote, state-of-the-art 5-kilowatt rotary spark gap transmitter and their wireless telegraph call sign was MGY. And this differs from her UK official number, which was 131428, and her official code letters, which were HVMP. A spark gap transmitter is a now obsolete type of radio transmitter which generates radio waves by means of an electric spark. All communication on the wireless transmitter was in Morse code, which is a method used in telecommunication to encode text as characters as standardized sequences of two different signal durations called dots and dashes or dits and daws. It was named after one of the inventors of the telegraph, Samuel Morse.
The transmitter on Titanic was one of the first Marconi installations that used a rotary spark gap, which gave Titanic's messages a distinctive, almost musical tone that could easily be told apart from other signals. This transmitter was also one of the most powerful in the world, guaranteed to broadcast well over a radius of 350 miles. That means she had better signal strength than all other ships at that time. To get this broadcasting strength, there was an elevated T antenna, also called a T aerial or flat top antenna, that spanned the entire length of the ship, and it was used for both transmitting and receiving messages. The normal operating frequency used was 500 kilohertz, but the equipment was advanced enough to hit the short wavelength of 1000 kilohertz that most smaller vessels with shorter antennas used, and this is important. In the case of an emergency, Titanic would be able to reach out to all sorts of ships, and not just big ocean liners and cruise ships. So, it was safe to say that Titanic was set up well. It is important to note that not all ships had mandatory 24-hour watches on their wireless telegraphs, and this would prove fatal in the case of Titanic. We'll cover that next week. As for her layout, Titanic was 882 feet and 9 inches long, with a 92 foot and 6 inch beam, a height of 175 feet from the keel to the top of the funnels, a draft of 34 feet and 7 inches, a depth of 64 feet and 6 inches, and she spanned 10 decks. She displaced 46,329 gross registered tons for internal volume, and as for her total displacement, it would be 52,310 tons. She could carry 2,435 passengers and 892 crew for a total of 3,327, though there are sources that claim her capacity was 3,547, so we do have to take that into account. All Olympic-class liners had 10 decks, including the top of the officers' quarters, and passengers were able to access 8 of these decks. From the bottom up, the decks were the Orlop decks and the tank top underneath that, were the lowest of the low on Titanic, well below the waterline. The Orlop decks were where your cargo space was. The tank top was the inner bottom of the ship's hull, and this is where the ship's boilers, engines, turbines, and generators were kept. It was broken up into the engine rooms and boiler rooms, and passengers, of course, were not allowed in these areas since they were filthy and dangerous. They were connected to the other decks via flights of stairs, and twin spiral staircases near the bow led up to D-deck. G-Deck, which was nicknamed the Lower Deck, was the lowest complete deck and it carried passengers. It also had the lowest portholes that were just barely above the waterline and water could lap at the glass frequently. On this deck, there was a traveling post office where letters and parcels were sorted for delivery when the ship docked in New York City, as well as the squash court. Food storage was also on G-Deck and it was interrupted at several spots by Orlop or partial decks that laid over the boiler, engine, and turbine rooms. F deck, or the middle deck, was the last complete deck. It was mostly for the third and second class accommodations, as well as several departments of the crew. The Turkish bath, kennels for the dogs, the swimming pool, and the third class dining saloon were all on F deck. E deck, also called the upper deck, was mostly for passenger accommodations for all three of the classes. As well as these accommodations, there were berths for seamen, stewards, cooks, and coal trimmers. Along the length of the deck was a long passageway that the crew called Scotland Road, and this referenced a famous street in Liverpool. Scotland Road was used by the third-class passengers as well as the crew members. The next deck is D-Deck, also known as the Saloon Deck. On this deck were three large public rooms, the first-class reception room, the first-class dining saloon, and the second-class dining saloon. There was also an open space for the third-class passengers on D-Deck. There were first, second, and third class cabins on D-Deck as well, with berths for the firemen in the bow section of this deck. It was also the highest level that the ship's bulkheads could reach, and after the sinking, the bulkheads on Britannic would reach up to Sea Deck as a result of the sinking of Titanic. Sea Deck, also called the Shelter Deck, was the highest deck to run uninterrupted from stem to stern. There were both well decks on this level, with the aft well deck serving as part of the third class promenade. Crew cabins were housed below the forecastle on this deck. Third class public rooms were here just below the poop deck, and in between were the majority of first class cabins and the second class library. B deck, also called the bridge deck, was the top weight bearing deck and the uppermost level of the hull. The rest of the decks will be located in the superstructure. Here, there were more first class passenger accommodations, with six palatial cabins that had private promenades. 
There was also the a la carte restaurant and the Cafe Parisian on this deck for the first class, and both were run by subcontracted chefs and their staff, all of whom perished in the sinking. On this deck, the second class smoking room and entrance hall existed as well as the raised forecastle of the ship being just forward of the bridge deck, and this accommodated the number one hatch, which was the main hatch down to the cargo holds. There were numerous pieces of machinery and the anchor housings on the bridge deck, and aft of this was the raised poop deck, which was 106 feet long. This was used as a promenade by third-class passengers, and it was where many of Titanic's passengers and crew made their last stand as the ship plummeted into the water. The forecastle and poop deck were separate from the bridge deck, with well decks in between. Then there was a deck, also lovingly called the promenade deck, and it was decadent. It extended along the entire 546-foot length of the superstructure uninterrupted, and it was reserved strictly for the first-class passengers to stroll. It also had the first-class cabins, the smoking room, the first-class lounge, the palm court, and the reading and writing rooms. The final deck, the highest on the ship, was the boat deck. The 16 lifeboats and four collapsible boats were on this deck. The bridge and wheelhouse were located at the forward end in front of the captain's and officer's quarters. The bridge loomed eight feet above the deck, extending out to either side so the ship could be controlled easily while navigating the dock. The wheelhouse was in the bridge, and here's where the ship was steered and much of the navigation took place. On the boat deck, there was the entrance to the first class grand staircase and the gymnasium both located amidships along the raised roof for the first class lounge, where the beautiful glass dome we see in the grand staircase was located. In the aft section of the ship was the roof of the first class smoking room and the much more modest second class entrance. The wooden deck was divided into four sections, strictly segregated to keep crew and the first and second class separate. It was divided into a space for officers, the first class, the second class, and the engineers, with the lifeboats lining the sides of the deck except for the first class section, so that the view of the ocean was uninterrupted. If there had been more lifeboats here, possibly everyone could have been saved. The radio room was also located here on the boat deck, making it conveniently close to the bridge. If you were a passenger on Titanic, no matter the class, you could still expect a vast difference in the quality of accommodations on Titanic when compared to other vessels. It was meant to be the epitome of luxury, from the elite down to the common man. According to RMS Titanic's general arrangement plans, she could accommodate 1,006 third-class passengers, 614 second-class, and 833 first-class, for a maximum capacity of 2,453 as we covered earlier. The capacity for crew members exceeded 900, however, as we covered earlier, her crew was 892 men. This is where that original capacity of 3,547 comes from, citing from many documents of her original configuration. Again, there is a debate on this, so I'm going to leave her capacity at the standard 3,327 passengers and crew. As well as having state-of-the-art technology like we covered earlier, her design was progressive as well. Most passenger liners at the time were typically decorated in a heavy, dark style like that of an English country house or a manor house, which was historically the main residence of the lord of a manor. The design seen in these types of liners was dark, full of patterned wallpapers, and lots of dark wood tones. A good example of this would be the interior of the RMS Lusitania and RMS Mauritania. As for RMS Titanic, she was laid out to be lighter and more open, similar to that of more modern high-class hotels. The Ritz Hotel was actually an inspiration for some of her finishes of furnishings. The first-class cabins were laid out in the Empire style, which is an early 19th century design movement in architecture, furniture, and other decorative arts representing the second phase of neoclassicism. This style flourished between 1800 and 1815, during the Consulate and French Empire periods. This style ranged from the Renaissance to Louis Quinn styles, and it was used to lavishly decorate public rooms and cabins in both the second and first class areas of RMS Titanic. The goal was to make the passengers feel like they were in a floating hotel instead of on board a ship, and one passenger later recalled that after entering the ship's interior, you would quote, at once lose the feeling that we are on board ship and seem instead to be entering the hall of some great house on shore. All pictures available of Titanic really sell this point. It does seem bougie, luxurious, and just exquisite. 
first class passengers had a lot to be excited about on Titanic that you might not find on other ships at the time, including a squash court, a seven foot deep saltwater swimming pool, a gymnasium to work out in, and a Turkish bath. The Turkish bath itself had an electric bath, steam room, massage room, cool room, and a hot room. And if that doesn't seem luxurious enough, the rest assured that the enormous first-class common rooms were spacious and beautifully decorated, oozing excess and riches. The first-class lounge was styled after the Palace of Versailles in France, which was the former residence of King Louis XIV, as well as a massive reception room when you came aboard the ship, and a reading and writing room, and for the gentlemen, a men's smoking room. The a la carte restaurant was styled after the Ritz Hotel and was run as a concession by the famous Italian restaurateur Gaspare Gatti. Ironically, he's the most famous now for his work on Titanic. The Café Parisien was styled like a French sidewalk cafe, even including ivy-covered trellises and wicker furniture. And this was a section to the a la carte restaurant. As we covered last week, after the success of this, Olympic had one added as well that was more open so you could eat in the fresh air. This came as an additional cost to first-class passengers. In the Café Parisien, the elitist of the elite could dine on fine, haute French cuisine while bathed in the luxury surrounding them. If neither of these restaurants suits your fancy, fret not. The Veranda Café, where tea and light refreshments were served in total view of the ocean, was the place for you. I'd definitely be at the Veranda Café, enjoying a cup of tea and watching the waves. The dining saloon for the first class on D-Deck was designed by Charles Fitzroy Dahl, and the room was massive, at 114 feet long by 92 feet wide, making it as wide as the entire beam of the ship. It was actually the largest room afloat, and could seat almost 600 passengers at a time. I've never been on a modern cruise ship, most of which have larger dining rooms, but I can't imagine Titanic's dining room. That is insane to think that it was that big and that beautifully decorated. As for the third class, which was commonly referred to as steerage at the time, the accommodations were far less bougie as first and second. However, they were still better than that of many other ships at the time. They were still, for the most part, segregated as we saw in earlier ships like SS Atlantic, with single men in the bow, single ladies and families in the stern to protect the single ladies from the single men, though there were plenty of common areas for everyone to mingle freely, and this wasn't upheld as strictly as we saw it to be aboard SS Atlantic. White Star Line was adopting improved standards for the immigrant class because they knew that much of their clientele and profit came from the third class. On most other North Atlantic passenger ships that were contemporaries of Titanic, third class consisted of little more than open dormitories with rows upon rows of bunks in the forward part of the vessel, where hundreds of people would sleep with poor ventilation and inadequate food or toilets. So it would be filthy, hot, and miserable for the entire voyage. As well as this, White Star Line provided small but private comfortable cabins capable of housing two, four, six, eight, or ten passengers. This was a huge step up for third-class travel, and White Star Line knew what they were providing. The third class also had their own dining saloon, as well as public gathering space such as the open deck space on the poop deck at the stern, the forward and aft well decks, and a large open space on D-deck that could be used as a social hall of sorts. There was even a smoking room for the third class men, as well as a general room on C-deck that could be used as a reading and writing room. They weren't glamorous, but they were still well above par for the time period. All three classes had leisure activities to pass the time at sea. It's boring to just stare at the ocean for a week, so there were amenities like the library, smoking rooms, the gymnasium, and areas for the passengers to socialize and chat on the open decks. There was also areas to relax on the promenades in deck chairs or wooden benches, and there was a roster of sorts posted before Titanic set sail so that the public would know which members of the elite were aboard the ship. Ambitious mothers also would take the opportunity to use the list to pick out well-to-do bachelors who they could introduce their beautiful daughters to in hopes of creating a lasting family dynasty, similar to what we see in James Cameron's Rose DeWitt Bucator Inn. She was engaged to Cal Hockley to set her and her mother Ruth up and save them from the debt her late father left behind. Of course, one of her most distinctive and memorable features was the Grand Staircase. It was built of solid English oak with a sweeping curve, and it descended through seven decks of the ship from the boat deck all the way down to E-deck. After this, it ended in a simplified single flight of stairs on F-deck. 
an enormous dome of wrought iron and glass enclosed it, allowing natural light to flood into the space and make it feel light, airy, and large. Off each landing of the staircase, there was access to ornate entrance halls paneled in the William and Mary style, which is a furniture design common from 1700 to 1725. The rooms were lit by ormolu, which is a gilding technique of applying finely ground high carat gold mercury amalgam to a bronze fixture and crystal light fixtures. Imagine how glittery, light, and gorgeous all of these landings must have been. The uppermost landing on the boat deck had a large wooden panel that contained a clock, and we've seen this in multiple movies. The clock was ordained with figures of honor and glory crowning time around the clock's face. Very sadly, when the ship snapped in two, it snapped through the grand staircase and thus it was entirely destroyed in the sinking, leaving behind a void in the middle of the ship that modern explorers used to explore all of the different deck spaces. It's been suggested, but not confirmed, so do take this with a pinch of salt, that the entire grand staircase was actually ejected upwards through the dome during the sinking. I have no idea why this would happen, but that's actually terrifying to think about. All pictures we have of the Grand Staircase are actually of the identical staircase aboard RMS Olympic. Titanic wasn't just meant for ferrying passengers, however. As RMS Titanic, she was a Royal Mail steamer, and this meant that she could carry a substantial amount of mail and cargo with her. She could carry mail under contract with the Royal Mail and for the United States Post Office Department, and so she needed a place to keep all of these valuables. There was 26,800 cubic feet of space reserved for the storage of parcels, letters, and specie, which is a type of bullion, coins, and other monetary valuables. The C post office on RMS Titanic on G-Deck was manned by five postal clerks. Three were American and two were British. They each worked 13 hours daily, seven days a week, and they would sort roughly 60,000 parcels daily. Talk about thankless work. When you have people on your ship, you also end up with a lot of baggage, especially for the upper classes. For the first and second class luggage, there was 19,455 cubic feet reserved. However, mail and luggage weren't the only items in the cargo hold. There was regular cargo too. This ranged from food to furniture and even a 1912 Renault type CE Coupe de Ville motor car. Despite the rumors of riches on Titanic, most of the cargo was just regular old stuff. No gold, jewels, or heart of the ocean necklaces. One of the more valuable things on board, a jeweled copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, which is the 1859 translation from Persian to English by Edward Fitzgerald of a selection of quatrains attributed to Omar Khayyam, was only valued at 405 pounds in 1912, which would be about 59,185 pounds in 2023. As we know from the Senate inquiry into the sinking, there was a claim for the compensation filed with Commissioner Gilchrist for the single most expensive item on the ship, which was a large neoclassical oil painting by French artist Mary Joseph Blondel, entitled La Circusaine à Boin. The painting's owner was a first-class passenger named Moritz Hakan Bjornstrom Stefansson, a Swedish businessman who had survived the sinking, and he filed a claim for $100,000 to compensate for the loss of the painting. Just for perspective, that would be about $3,059,763 today. To get this cargo on board, Titanic needed cranes, and so she had eight electric cranes, three steam winches, and four electric winches to lift all of this cargo, baggage, and parcels into and out of the cargo holds. It's estimated, however not confirmed, that RMS Titanic used around 415 tons of coal in Southampton alone just running these cranes and winches to load the ship and provide light and heat to the crew working before the ship left Southampton. Of everything we've talked about design-wise so far, the most important has to be the lifeboats. Just like her older sister Olympic, which we covered last week, RMS Titanic had 20 lifeboats. She had two emergency cutters with a capacity of 40 people each, as well as four Engelhart collapsible lifeboats labeled A to D that could carry up to 47 people, and 14 standard wooden Harland and Wolf lifeboats capable of carrying up to 65 people each. This adds up to a grand total of 1,178 seats in the lifeboats. If the ship was fully loaded at 3,327 people, this would doom 2,149 of them. All of Titanic's lifeboats were stowed on the boat deck and were connected to davits by ropes, with the exception of collapsibles A and B. 
all of the lifeboats other than the collapsible boats were numbered from 1 to 16, with the starboard having all of the odd numbers and the port side having all of the even numbers. The numbers started with their lowest numerical value and moved upwards as you moved toward the stern of the ship. Both of the cutters were kept constantly swung out and hanging from their davits so they could be launched immediately in case of an emergency. Collapsibles C and D were kept on the boat deck in their davits, immediately behind 1 and 2, respectively. A and B were stored upside down on top of the roof to the officers' quarters, and it made it difficult to launch these by hand due to their weight and the lack of davits, and this would have consequences in the sinking. Each boat carried food, water, blankets, and a single spare life belt. Lifeline ropes attached to the sides of the lifeboats would allow them to save additional swimmers if needed. I'm a geek for davits, so we are going to geek out on them for a minute. And we are going to start by defining them in case you don't know what a davit is. A davit is a small crane on board a ship, especially one of a pair for suspending or lowering lifeboats. Britannic had the coolest davits, and I can't wait to cover those at the end of the month. As for Titanic, she had 16 sets of davits, each able to handle four lifeboats as Alexander Carlyle had originally planned for. And this means, dear listeners, Carlyle planned for RMS Titanic to carry up to 64 standard wooden lifeboats. That would have been enough seats for up to 4,000 people, much more than her actual maximum capacity and everyone would have been saved. So why didn't they do that? They didn't want to clutter the deck space and affect the view for the first class passengers. I don't know if you can feel it, but I just rolled my eyes into the back of my skull so far they may have just gotten stuck. Instead of going the safe route and having up to 64 lifeboats, White Star Line went with the almost bare minimum that the Board of Trade required, capable of saving only one-third of Titanic's total capacity. The Board of Trade's regulations required British vessels over 10,000 tons, which Titanic qualifies as, to carry at least 16 lifeboats with 990 seats for people. So we do have to give credit where credit is due, and acknowledge the fact that White Star Line did have more than what was required in terms of lifeboats. The reason for this messed up line of thinking is that lifeboats were originally meant to ferry passengers between the sinking vessel and the rescuing vessel, not to keep the entire population of the ship afloat until help arrived. Had SS Californian, which was only about 10 miles away from Titanic, responded to Titanic's pleas for aid, the lifeboats probably could have ferried all of the passengers to Californian as planned. However, as we all know, this did not happen, and this is why ships are required to carry more lifeboat space than there are passengers and have regular lifeboat drills. Due to the enormity of the Olympic class, there was a massive engineering hurdle that Harlan and Wolf had to jump. At the time, no shipbuilder had ever attempted such massive ships. The ships were built on Queen's Island in Belfast, which is now lovingly known as the Titanic Quarter. To make room for the slipways needed for the behemoths, Harland and Wolf tore down three existing smaller slipways and built two large enough for the sisters. At that time, they were also the biggest slipways the world had ever seen. If you're unfamiliar with a slipway, it's also known as a boat ramp, boat launch, or boat deployer, and it is a ramp on the shore by which ships or boats can be moved to and from the water. If you've ever done casual boating at most local lakes, then you may have seen a much smaller version. Slipways for ships can be lowered to allow ships to enter the water easier, and in the smaller version for boats, you can simply back the boat trailer into the water using a truck or SUV that can haul it, detach the boat into the water, and drive off. It's the same concept for Titanic, just in a much larger scale. The construction for the two sisters, RMS Olympic and RMS Titanic, took place almost simultaneously as they sat side by side. Olympic, as we know from last week, was first laid down on December 16, 1908, and Titanic would be laid down three months later on March 31, 1909. Each ship took roughly 26 months to build, and they followed almost identical construction processes since the ships were nearly identical themselves. Both ships were built this way, but we are going to focus on Titanic's perspective from now on, so keep Olympic in the very back of your mind. Titanic was designed like a big box girder on the water. A box or tubular girder is a girder that forms an enclosed tube with multiple walls, as opposed to an I or H beam. The keel was supposed to be like the spine of the ship with the frames acting like the rib cage, and at the base, there was a 5 foot 3 inch deep double bottom that supported 300 frames. Each of these frames was between 24 inches and 36 inches apart, with each frame reaching around 66 feet long. 
the frames went up to B deck, and they'd be covered in the steel plates that created the outer hull of Titanic. The rivets would hold the steel to the framework, with the rivets themselves adding 1,200 tons of weight to the ship. These rivets were either hammered in by hand or by hydraulic riveting machines. On Titanic, there were 2,000 enormous rolled steel plates. Each single sheet weighed 2.5 to 3 tons, was roughly 1 to 1.5 inches thick, and was 30 feet long and 6 feet wide. They were adhered to the hull in a clinkered pattern. We have talked about this in one video in the past, but just to refresh, clinker build is a method of boat building where the edges of hull planks overlap one another. The other popular type of hull construction is carval construction where the hull is a smooth surface, and generally it is considered much stronger than a clinker built hull. Later in the 1990s, experiments were performed to test the strength of the steel used on the hull, and it was found to be weak and brittle when subjected to extremely cold temperatures, much like the ocean waters on April 14, 1912. Though the quality of the material was good, it just wasn't as advanced as shipbuilding is now, and our advancement in shipbuilding and technology is partly due to the sinking of Titanic. Of the last items adhered to Titanic before launching were the two side anchors and single center anchor. The creation of these anchors was an utter nightmare to say the least, being they were so large, with the center anchor being the biggest anchor known to man at that point, and it weighed almost 16 tons. To transport this enormous anchor from the Noah Hingley and Sons Limited Ford shop near Dudley all the way to Belfast, it took 20 Clydesdale draft horses and one sturdy wagon to pull the anchor to the Dudley Rail Station two miles away from the shop. From there, the anchor took a train to Fleetwood before being loaded onto a ship and steaming into Belfast to meet her destined ship. For a little perspective, one Clydesdale horse can pull between 2,000 and 8,000 pounds depending upon the size of the horse, so their power cannot be underestimated. For even more perspective, one husky can pull 88 pounds. So to pull the anchor for Titanic, you'd need between 455 and 1,818 huskies to pull the anchor for Titanic to the rail station. That's a lot of fur. If you're wondering why I chose huskies, it's because I have one of my own. Enough about huskies, let's get back to Titanic. It cannot be understated how dangerous and difficult the construction for the Olympic class's eldest sisters was. And not only this, but safety regulations at Harlan and Wolf concerning the 15,000 men who worked there at the time would flabbergast us today. It was absolutely pathetic. Most of the work was done without safety gear like hand guards or hard hats on the machinery. Not only that, but children in the workforce was common, and so children worked in these conditions as well. During the building of Titanic, 246 injuries were recorded, let alone those that went unnoticed, with 28 being listed as severe. And by severe, we mean legs being crushed under falling pieces of steel, or arms being sawed off by machinery. Six people actually died during the construction and fitting out, with two others dying in the shipyard workshops and sheds. Just before the ship was launched, a large piece of wood fell on top of a worker and crushed him, killing him instantly. To me, that's just bad juju going into this ship before she even hits the water. It's eerie to think about. After this unfortunate mishap and the tedious construction, Titanic finally was launched just after lunch at 12.15 p.m. on March 31, 1909, in the presence of 100,000 spectators, as well as her proud owners, J. Bruce Ismay, Lord Peary, and J.P. Morgan. To prepare the slipway and make Titanic's entrance as easy as possible, 22 tons of tallow and soap were greased on the slipway to ease the ship into the River Lagan. Imagine applying that much soap to a slipway. That is just crazy to me, but it's also genius. For the White Star Line's traditional policy, Titanic wasn't formally named or christened right then and there during her launching. Any stories about the bottle of champagne not breaking against her hull and bouncing off during her launching is simply just a myth. She was launched without alcohol of any kind involved. She was then towed to the fitting out berth, and she'd spend the next year there getting her engines, funnels, and superstructure placed, and the interior was completed during this time as well. RMS Olympic and RMS Titanic, like I said, were twins. However, they were fraternal for a few major reasons. There were extensive changes to the interior, one of which was the change of B-deck promenade spaces, which weren't popular on Olympic, into first-class cabins, including two posh parlor suites with private promenade deck space. The a la carte restaurant was given more space, and they added the Café Parisien, which wasn't a feature on the Olympic. 
The biggest difference on the outside of Titanic and later Britannic, compared to her oldest sister Olympic, was the steel screen with sliding windows installed along the forward half of the A-deck promenade to add more shelter for passengers from cold sea spray and wind. This was a last-minute addition to the building plans by J. Bruce Ismay, and because of this and the aforementioned changes, Titanic was substantially heavier than Olympic, making her the largest ship afloat. The last-minute changes alongside pauses in the work and setbacks due to Olympic's collision in September 1911 delayed the launch of Titanic. If Titanic had been launched earlier, it's possible she wouldn't have come into contact with that iceberg. However, we shouldn't blame Olympic for this at all. It's a myriad of factors that went into her delays. After she was finally finished, it was on to sea trials for RMS Titanic. Most of these stories, I tell you, this ship went to sea trials and she passed. Luckily for us with Titanic, we have details of what happened on these sea trials and how they really went. She left Belfast for her sea trials early in the morning at 6 a.m. on Tuesday, April 2nd, 1912 two days after her fitting out was finished and eight days before she'd be in Southampton. Due to bad weather, her sea trials could not take place on Monday, but by the end of the day on Monday, the weather had cleared up and she was ready to go the next day. For the sea trials, there were 41 crewmen and 78 firemen, greasers, and stokers. It's not clear whether or not there were stewards aboard, but it doesn't seem like there were. Various representatives of multiple companies were on board Titanic for her sea trials, and this included Harold A. Sanderson of the International Mercantile Marine Company and Edward Wilding and Thomas Andrews of Harland and & Wolfe. The radio operators Jack Phillips and Harold Bride served as radio operators during the sea trials to fine-tune the Marconi equipment, with Francis Carruthers, a surveyor from the Board of Trade, also in attendance to make sure everything was in tip-top shape and followed regulation. Unfortunately, J. Bruce Ismay and Lord Peary were both too sick to attend the sea trials. During the trials, there were a number of tests performed. Think of it like buying a used car off a lot. You take the car out on the highway and get it up to top speed, take it back on the back roads and brake hard to make sure it stops, and test to make sure the blinkers, radio, and heater works, among other things. It's the same thing for sea trials, just on a larger and more professional scale. It was all carried out first in the Belfast Low before she made her way out to the Irish Sea. There were a number of tests on her handling characteristics over the course of 12 hours. She'd be driven at different speeds, pushing to see how fast she could go, just like you do with a car on the highway. While at speed, she was tested for her turning ability and a quote, crash stop, which is just like slamming on the brakes in a car. Though how they did this was to take the engines from full ahead and reverse it to full astern. She stopped in 3 minutes and 15 seconds after 850 yards. She sailed for about 80 nautical miles, averaging about 18 knots during this time. And during the sea trials, she maxed out at just under 21 knots, though we know they'd pushed past this threshold during the maiden voyage. She returned to Belfast at 7 p.m., and Carruthers was impressed enough to sign an agreement and account of voyages and crew, which was valid for 12 months. This agreement deemed Titanic seaworthy and capable of carrying passengers. An hour after this was signed, Titanic left Belfast for the very last time, sailing 570 nautical miles down to Southampton in about 28 hours. She arrived in Southampton on April 4th around midnight, being towed to berth 44. There, she'd be prepared for her journey and awaited the arrival of the rest of her crew and all of the passengers embarking in Southampton. Six days would pass to the morning that she left Southampton, Wednesday, April 10th, 1912. And after this, it was time to set sail. That's it for the building of Titanic, every nitty gritty detail I could find. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this very special episode, and I can't wait for next week when we get into the sinking. For anyone interested, I have my sources for this video's research listed in the video description. For my audio only listeners, it will be in the episode description. Thank you for tuning in to the second episode of Titanic Month on Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a 5-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. 
check out our community tab for updates and to interact with us. And don't forget to check out our second channel, Speed Force Media. Tune in next Sunday for the tragic tale of the sinking of RMS Titanic. Also, tune in every Monday this month for a different White Star Line themed bonus episode. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.